This is Creating Your Encore Career and Becoming a Silver Entrepreneur with your host, Lynn Freest. Lynn will share ideas and expert advice from people that are walking in your shoes and living their encore careers, where they want and at the pace they want. You'll start a company of one with confidence and knowledge to live a fulfilled life of freedom and ease. Lynn is a coach and leadership consultant whose mission is to show senior leaders and experts how to start something refreshing and new after a full career in the corporate environment. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the podcast, Creating Your Encore Career and Becoming a Silver Entrepreneur. This is episode 111, and it's Repurposing Your Career with Mark Miller. My goal is to help you create a compelling future for yourself in an encore career, or as I like to say, becoming a silver entrepreneur. I will also share ideas on companies can connect with talent that you can provide for them and create value for both the organization and for you. I always encourage you to visit my website and download the summary at the bottom of the podcast episode and use that as a tool to capture notes as you explore the concepts in this episode. And if you're considering or starting an encore career, please take the self-assessment quiz to help you create some quick clarity around your possible choices. Today, we're going to be talking with Mark Miller. Mark has literally written the book on encore careers, and it's titled Repurpose Your Career, A Practical Guide for the Second Half of Life. And it's in its third edition. Mark comes from a varied and diverse background. He has pivoted multiple times in his career. He's been in IT, a network architect, a training expert, a high school teacher, and a nonprofit fundraiser. He's even taken his business remotely and lives in Mexico. Mark started Career Pivot to help those in the second half of life make meaningful career decisions. As he says, we all want freedom to work how you want, when you want, and work on something you love. So some of the questions we'll talk about today include his journey in creating a career for the second half of life, examples of people he has worked with, what are the key steps and mistakes that he has seen, and what are the first steps in creating your encore career? Welcome, Mark. Again, I'm very grateful to have you on the podcast to share your wisdom with my audience, and uh, and I'm looking forward to it. Mark, I'd really ask you to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your journey. I know you've had a long and very successful journey, and and now you're even located in uh, Mexico. So please uh, share your journey with us. Sure, Lynn. I am a recovering engineer. Yes, there's a 12-step program for that. And my journey started with 22 years at IBM. They screwed me in my pension in 99. I left and went to work for a successful startup. Turns out them screwing uh, my pension was a huge financial windfall. I went to work for a semiconductor startup. We were acquired by Lucent. So I joke, I originally worked for IBM or the Borg. Yes, I was assimilated. Resistance was futile. And then our, the, my startup I worked for, Agira, was acquired by Lucent, which was the sister of the Borg. I then had a near-fatal bicycle accident back in 2002. I Yes, I hit a car head on at 50 miles an hour, and that was on a bicycle. Our combined speeds were over 50. Spent five days in the trauma center. Tore up a knee, broke a hip, dislocated a shoulder, broke a bunch of ribs, broke the clavicle. I had imprints, the pads of the helmet in my head, but I had no internal injuries and no brain injuries I'm willing to admit to. They had me walking in crutches in three days. I was back in a bike in 10 weeks and flying back to China in four months. Oh, by the way, I flew into Guangdong province, Shenzhen, November of 2002, which was the epicenter of SARS-V1. I got great timing. That left us, that startup, we didn't get rich, but we got debt-free. Son graduated from college in 2002, and that allowed us to pay off the house, finish funding, get our kids' college education. So in 2003, I laid myself off, and actually 2004, and I went off and taught high school math for a couple of years. I uh, couldn't do that. I had convinced myself I was an extrovert. I was not. I had made myself into something I really wasn't. I was a geek that could speak. I'm not. I'm a big, I collapsed in, in my second year. Just, I ran out of gas. I then went off and did nonprofit work for a year. Yes, I worked for the Jewish Community Association of Austin doing corporate business development. By the way, I'm not Jewish. I grew up in an entirely Jewish neighborhood in New Jersey. So being a non-Jew, being the face of a Jewish organization is interesting. I then got sucked up into another startup life size, which was a predecessor to Zoom. 
And I left there in 2011, again, completely burned out. Notice the pattern here. And I started Career Pivot in 2011 because I saw so many folks in our age demographic who had been spit out in the Great Recession. And I kept on looking, well, who's really focusing on our careers? And the answer was almost no one, because we were all supposed to go retire. And I hired a young history major who just graduated from St. Edwards University to do some research. He knew how to dig through databases. And I gave him some 10 questions. I said, go get me the facts behind it. And the data he found wasn't bad. It was God awful ugly. And to a large extent, it hasn't gotten any better. We are still very ill prepared to quote retire. And so that's when I started. My career has been constantly pivoting. I've made so many career changes, make your head spin. And even at, when I'm teaching high school, I was highly successful. I couldn't do that and stay healthy. I started a coaching practice. I wrote the Repurpose Your Career. We're now in the third edition. I launched the podcast in 2016 to support the second edition. And about 2016, the end of it, oh, I could like to say October of 2016, I got my October surprise. It had nothing to do with Hillary Clinton. I got my health insurance premium and it had gone up 80%. My wife and I were both self-employed. We were under 65 pre-Medicare. And at that point, we said, yeah, let's think about becoming an expense. And we landed here in Ajiji, Mexico, and that's A-J-I-C, in June of 2018, primarily for healthcare. And we've gotten phenomenally good health care at a fraction of the price in the U.S. And my wife is a retired nurse, which means she's a total pain in the butt patient. But we moved, I moved from a direct coaching practice to a membership model because my thought was I wanted to model something after the job club that I had been involved with for a dozen years in Austin, Launchpad Job Club, around the concept of it takes a community and many of us either have to or want to continue to work into our 70s. How are you going to do that? There's so many ways to make money now and find fulfillment that doesn't involve working for the man. I don't know about you, but I don't ever want to work for somebody again. And there are a gazillion ways. So one of the things I've focused on is how do we, particularly with this pandemic, how do we help people cope with what's going on? But also, how do you shift your mindset away from the way we were raised to what today's world looks like? I was raised to be an employee, to go work for a father-like company that would take care of me. And I would walk off into the sunset with a pension. Now, I don't even know how to define the word pension because <laughs> no one has one anymore. That's where I'm sitting these days. Great. And I think that's interesting, too. I've also been intrigued by the uh, flip side. In some of my consulting work, I'm an engineer also, and I've done some consulting around manufacturing here in our local area. But in general, nobody can find people. So it's one of those things where we don't have enough talent, and yet we have our age demographic, in some cases, on the sidelines, whether they want to be on the sidelines or not. It's interesting. Another thought i curious and you mentioned was the mindset, or sometimes I phrase it as habits of thinking and habits of action. And I think that was something that at least I found, I had to make a big shift coming out of the corporate world because I, whether it be how my mindset or my thinking or literally how I organize my day, all of a sudden I have complete freedom to do it, but I had to create some new habits to actually get something done. You know, one of the things I've done in my community is put accountability partners and put mastermind groups in because very often we got accountability from our employers. The other shift of mindset that requires very often is I often talk about with the pandemic, there's tremendous disruption, tremendous disruption. And so with disruption comes opportunity. So do you look at that disruption as, oh, crap? which means you probably have a fixed mindset. Or do you say, wow, let's see what we can do with this. That is a growth mindset. And to quote Diane Wingert, who I've had on my podcast twice, she's an entrepreneur coach. I love her comment that says, you have to get started before you're ready. 
Now, how many of us grew up with the mantra, if it's not worth doing right, it's not worth doing. So if we wait until we can do it right, uh, probably 15 people will, or 100 people will go flying by us beforehand. And we have to be willing to say, okay, I'm going to do this imperfectly. I'm going to learn from it. I might fail. And of course, we came out of the generation where failure was not an option. Now it's fail often, fail fast, fail forward. That's a really different world than we grew up in. Absolutely. Uh, my background in manufacturing was Six Sigma. We were going to be 99.99% sure we were right before we did something. Then I've started working with myself and entrepreneurs, and all of a sudden, hey, you better start moving when you have 65% of what you need to know, because one, you may never know more than that, and you can't wait. It's interesting. A lot of people look at the innovations in manufacturing, for example, and say, oh, this is all new, like 3D printing. By the way, I bought a 3D printer at IBM in 1989. Technology has been around a lot longer than you think. But the willingness to implement it and take advantage of it, and of course, the computing power has greatly increased in the materials you can use with it. But you have to be willing to take risks. And you working for a big manufacturing company, me working for big computer companies, you didn't take risks. No, nope, not at all. Yeah, that shift in mindset, a good friend and coach of mine currently, she keeps reminding me, uh, I have to start be comfortable practicing in public. So uh, whether it be starting a podcast or putting myself out there in some other way, that whole idea of practicing in public is not something I spent most of my career doing. <laughs> That's right. Going out and sending out a lot of requests. I have, I have a good friend, Gary O'Neill, who's been on my podcast several times and who he's a recruiter. He'll say, I want you to email 600 people. And people go, oh, but I'm going to get a lot of rejection. He says, no, you're not. You may get a lot of silence. But if you get a 20% response rate, that's possibly 120 people you get to talk to. Well, that means you got to put yourself out there and be vulnerable. And most of us guys don't like being vulnerable. It's one of our weaknesses. <laughs> so as you, you think about some of the people yourself or, or the people that you've been helping, what are some of the key first steps you've encouraged them to make or recalling what you made? What are the first things, if we're going to take that step out of the corporate life, what do we have to do first? For a lot of us, when we say, okay, I don't want to work for someone else anymore. For most of us, I want to help somebody. Okay, who exactly do you want to help? It's not everybody. Is narrow that down. And the more you can niche down, the better. And the second step is how do you want to help them? In other words, what process do you want to take in order to provide the kind of service you want to provide? And then third is, will those people accept your help? And some of this is I had Diane Wu David on my podcast. She wrote the book, Future Proof. And in your current job, what she recommends is experiment with your career. Do small side projects, low risk, that you can see, let's go try this. Let's see if it really is something I like to do. I have a whole chapter in my book on MSU disorder. And MSU stands for make stuff up. By the way, we all do it. Anybody who says they don't do it is lying. When we have a void in our knowledge, we tend to make stuff up. So what happens for with, well, I'll use the example. Some people say, I want to take this hobby and I want to turn it into a business. Sometimes when you turn that hobby into a business, it's no longer fun anymore. I used to rebuild cars with my best man and Andy was 20 years older than I. And when he did start to try to do some work for other people, he really hated it. He wanted to do the stuff he wanted to do. So it isn't necessarily that you can take your passion and turn it into a job or into a money-making scheme because it may not make sense, but you got to go try it. And the other piece is, particularly at our age, is how much money do you need to make? Do you need to make money at all? I've got a guy in my online community that I wrote up, David Jenkins, who's now a city council member in La Plata, Maryland. He didn't do it to make money. He actually had to run a political campaign. I've got another gentleman who is working for now Get Set Up. And GetSetUp.io is a Series A startup that I've partnered with that is this one of the senior learning platforms. He's teaching and managing the travel section, right? And then I've got another gentleman. He needs to make money. 
Then I've got another gentleman, Alec Aarons, who's going to be in my podcast here shortly, who he started a coaching practice. And he's also teaching for a couple of these platforms. He's found some coaching platforms. And by the way, he's doing this to fund his photography, which he also hopes to make money from. And all three have very different monetary means. All have taken very different approaches. But in every last one, their quote, encore career sometimes is attached to what they used to do, as with David, who used to be in city government. And other people, like Alec was a financial CFO kind of guy. Russ Eanes, who's the, working for Get Set Up, by the way, he was the executive director for Menno Media, the publishing arm of the Mennonite Church. And by the way, they didn't make a direct line to any of these. Right. Yeah, I know one thing I worked on for myself and I've encouraged others is that in the corporate world, we get so used to thinking of ourselves in terms of job titles or job descriptions or whatever. And I know several people have encouraged me to think deeper about the activities that you've done and that you enjoyed because it may morph into something different than you would have expected, but don't get stuck on your, your job titles as, when you move forward. I can't remember who, who on my podcast talked about this, but sometimes we brand ourselves around our profession, doctors, lawyers, engineers, or sometimes we brand ourselves around the companies we work for. And in either of those cases, when you take that away, some people lose their identity. I saw that. I went through the near bankruptcy at IBM in the early 90s. When I was in my 30s, and I had a whole bunch of colleagues who had been there for 25, 30 years and were told to walk out the door and retire, and they weren't ready. They lost their entire sense of identity because they were IBMers. And that's where I realized I don't ever want to be like that. There was a valuable lesson for me early in my career. I was like 36 at the time to say, I don't want to be like that. Sure. And it's never too late to change, as you've mentioned several people that have, again, rethought of what they are and then allowed them to rethink what they do also. What are uh, some of the uh, missteps you've seen people make? And maybe you've shared some, but other thoughts where you've seen people launch themselves out and it doesn't work out so well. Sometimes you just need to try to see whether it's going to work. I've talked about the fact that I've had three career failures. First one was in the late 90s. I've been working in a very elite sales group, an IBM briefing center. My boss, who was wonderful, left, went to work for IBM Global Services. She pulled me over to be a consultant. And my one and only project was working for one of the three major short-term loan companies, pawn shops. I got in there and their business model made me want to puke. Loaning money to the poor at 20% a month, not a year, a month, just made me just, I don't want to be part of this. And I worked with a bunch of unhappy people, unhappy married people, unhappy divorced people, unhappy single people. I don't want this. I bailed it nine months. said, I've had enough. I failed and I recovered just fine. Now, I had places in IBM. I had a plan B. My school teaching is another good example of where I... After a year and a half, I couldn't do that. I got depressed. I should have quit after my first year, but failure is not an option. And it took me a long time to recover. When I went to work for the Jewish Community Association of Austin, I determined in six months, this is not going to work. Won't get into the details, but what they were asking me to do was impossible. So, by the way, there were two other people prior to me who had failed. So I planned my exit for six months later. I left immediately after the fall gala, I had it all planned out, and wow, I rolled forward. So I failed fast. I had a plan B from the very beginning. And I always, I look from all three experiences, I learned something. If you're going to fail, make sure you learn something from it. <laughs> and the more homework you can do, the more, I like to say, advice. I claim that every one of my career changes has been what I call a half-step career change. In other words, I had one foot in the old world, one foot in the new world, and there was almost always a relationship that pulled me across. In other words, I never did it alone, which means you got to go ask for help. Ooh, that help word. And yeah, sometimes you're going to fail. That's okay. As long as you understand the ramifications, minimize your risks, understand what risk really means. I'll use the example. We had a conversation in 
in, inside my online community in one of the mastermind groups around risk. Now I can look back at my career and my life and I've done some things that I thought were real risky. When I left IBM, I thought I was taking big risks. I wasn't taking a risk. We were in the process of being acquired by Lucent. It was not a risk. But then again, when I went on my bicycle ride, where my wife thought I was nuts, I'm just going bike ride with my club. Turns out I was going on an incredibly dangerous road. I'd been on it before. Eh, it was the big deal. I paid for that. I didn't perceive the risk. That's where we have to go back and look at our careers and look at what worked, what didn't work, when were you happy, why were you happy? And that can offer you a lot of insight into who you are. Yep, absolutely. Also, you mentioned several times the mastermind groups, and certainly that's something that I've found very beneficial because as a solar entrepreneur, quite frankly, it can be kind of lonely, and uh, especially when you're trying to learn things. And so I've had the good fortune to be engaged in several different groups where they may not have had the same business I had, but we were all learning, quote, business together. And I, for me, that was a bit of big help. And so I'm sure your mastermind groups provide that for each other. Yeah. I mean, for anybody who's not familiar with the mastermind concept is typically used with uh, small business owners, solopreneurs, where you meet on a regular basis. And there are a couple different formats, but the idea is allowing you to ask for help from the master mind, the collective thought. And the goal is to get you out from inside your own head, because we know the inside of our head is a very dark place. <laughs> a lot of graffiti on those walls. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff we make up. And it's great when you say, yeah, I think I'm going to do that. And people go, boy, that's a really good idea. Wow, that is really stupid. Why did you think that? And you can have an honest discussion on what's your thought process. And it's interesting. I've reached a point in my life where I'm, I'm 65 years old. We're living in a very inexpensive paradise in Mexico. In my business, I no longer have to make decisions based on what's going to make me money. Long as the business pays for itself and I make some money, I'm fine. That allows me to a different decision process than what I used to use five years ago when I was trying to pay my $1,500 a month health insurance bill and put some money on the table to you know pay for stuff. And so you start, again, mindset shift, and you got to allow yourself to be to do that. And my guess is, Lynn, you've done a lot of that in the last few years. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh <laughs> The mindset of where I am today is uh, very different than when I started. And I'm much more comfortable with the risk now than I was when I first left and was, oh, I can't make this mistake. I can't make this. Well, now I go out there and I make a lot more mistakes than maybe my family is always comfortable with, but that's okay. My job now is to be a, a bother to them, not necessarily a shining light. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> As you think about some specific skills that you acquired or others in your groups have acquired? What are there? Obviously, technology is something. Do you, do, you, do we over obsess about technology or because I was just interviewed a, a woman who's a, an executive coach and she uses minimal technology in her business and she's quite happy with that. But I know there's all kinds of technology available. What are your thoughts on that? There's so much stuff that's available at very low cost. There are a couple of key things that you need, depending on what you're doing. My most valuable tool for me is my calendaring tool. It saves me tons of time. I happen to use Schedule Ones. There, God knows there's Calendly and there's a bunch of others. So I, someone says, yeah, I want to talk to you. Fine. Schedule time. Send them a link. Schedule time on my calendar. It also takes care of all the time zones. I use a product called SaneBox. I've taught it to manage my email. Like right now, because of my podcast is sufficiently successful, I get bombarded with people who want to write blog posts and want to be on my podcast. And they use an automated three sequence email. And you know, I get irritated with them. So I can take someone and if the bottom of the email says, if you don't want to hear from me again, hit this unsubscribe, in other words, opt out rather than opt in, that's spam. And I put them in my, what we call my sane black hole which means I'll never see an email from them again. For me, those are things that are very valuable. Learning how to use this video technology, like you and I right now, when you're looking at me, I have myself framed up from, 
from the waist up rather than just seeing my head. If I do a video, I actually put up lighting. I used to teach this stuff. Yeah, that's important. But I find the one of the most daunting things that people find is sales. And what I do with everybody in my mastermind group is I send them the book, Getting Naked. It's a Patrick Lencioni, New York Times bestseller about consultative selling. And it's a story. And it's a story about a business owner of consulting house who sold his boutique consulting firm because he had older parents. And he sold it to this big consulting house, I'll call A. And the company A sent in their guy to figure out what went on. He discovered very quickly that the boutique consulting firm won every time they went head to head. The boutique consulting firm charged much higher rates and they didn't have a sales team. And they had no sales strategy. They didn't have a formal sales strategy. She's going, what they do? What the hell do you do? We walk in and say, hey, what's your problem? Let's talk about it. In other words, walking in and being vulnerable, not walking in with the answer. And what I quickly find is just about everybody, the biggest introvert can go in because your goal is to ask questions and listen. And it's developing those listening skills. And one of the things I'm seeing that's coming out of this pandemic when My wife and I went back to Austin, Texas, where we lived for 40 years back in May to get vaccinated. And I had 26 coffee meetings. And what I quickly found in the first five or six, I really sucked at listening because I had stopped having face-to-face meetings with people I didn't know or I knew I hadn't talked to in a long time. And my active listening skills had just gone in the trash. And I had to relearn how to do that. And so... If you talk about skills, our listening skills are probably more important than anything else. So hopefully I've taken you in a roundabout. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, thank you. And that's an important distinction because uh, as people who are, I'll say, executives or experts in the corporate world, as they leave, they still have to own their expertise. But on the other hand, now it's not you're going to go in and deliver orders or deliver your opinion. Uh, like you say, all of a sudden you have to own that you know something, but you have to be able to listen to the what the other people need. And that's, again, different than maybe people experienced in corporate life. Yeah, very often what someone thinks they need is not what they really need. And it's a matter of learning how to diagnose quickly. Like, for example, my first business coach taught me that my goal in the first meeting is to figure out, number one, can they pay me? Can they afford me? By the way, I was still going to try and spend my first hour trying to help them. But two, identify those people that you want to run away from. Because there are some people you go, wow, this is an ideal client. And there are other people going, oh, they can afford to pay me, but they suck the life out of you. I don't want to do that. It's not worth it. And normally when you get it into initially, your the qualifications for a client is usually a pulse. And a wallet. And a, and a, and a, <laughs> yeah. and a checkbook or a wallet. You can tell we're both a little bit older. Yeah, But yeah, that's true. And the, that ability to say no so that you, again, just don't damage your own well-being in the process of trying to serve somebody makes all the difference. Yep. So yeah, you've got to be able to identify who do you want to work with and who do you want to run away from. And often that takes practice, taking on a few clients that you go, ooh, that's not worth it. One would hope that that's one of the experiential things that you and I can bring to things where we've seen who are the people we don't want to work with in in our past lives. And so hopefully a little better at recognizing that. Sometimes we, depending on how needy we are, sometimes we have amnesia. <laughs> I joke, yeah. I, I left my first tech startup and I left tech and went to teach high school math and said, I'm never going back to tech. Then after teaching and then going to work nonprofit, I did what is typical of, I returned to what I knew. And I went to work for a second tech startup, which financially was rewarding. Emotionally, I worked for a sociopath. In many ways, it was a horrible experience. Financially, it was, I I wrote out the Great Recession. I joke, I I hired on December of 2007, the beginning of the Great Recession, and and wrote it out through 2011. But it was a horrible experience. And I paid for it, my blood pressure, my health, my mental well-being. But I learned a bunch, but not doing that again. I just, I made the knee-jerk reaction to go back to what was familiar. What is familiar isn't always what's good for us. 
Yeah, I think that could be a whole nother uh, conversation, a whole nother podcast is the whole how much attention we should pay to our well-being, especially as we don't have 30 years, nor are we 30 years old. We need to pay more attention to that. And, and everyone should, but interesting concept. Well, I thank you very much, Mark, for your time and attention and your insights here. And we will include in the uh, show notes all the links to your, you have a marvelous depth and breadth of information that people can work with you or learn from you on. And with that, again, I thank you. Any final thoughts you have for the audience? Yeah, the key piece is, as we, I like to say, those of us in the second half of life, we need to, in this time of our life, be adaptable. So much is changing. And if you look at that change as a challenge to get you excited and an opportunity, that's where you're really going to thrive. I live with a lot of retirees. And you know what? I don't want to retire. I think retire is a dirty word. My intention is to live till, you know, well into my hundreds. Fortunately, I actually hike with some 75, 80 year old women who kick my butt going up the mountain. That's my role model. And so what do you want to be in 10 years, 20 years? Because for most of us, by the way, we're going to live into our 90s. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, how do you want to spend 20, 30 years, whatever it might be. Yep. And understand what's important to you. I mean, when we moved here, we've gotten rid of almost all of our stuff. We have very few possessions anymore. There's some people look at me going, I can't give up X, Y, Z. Yeah. Those are what we refer to as anchors. And just like we talked about, you have an older parent, it's an anchor. It's a very reasonable anchor. But understand what your anchors are. And are they really that important? Again, thank you and uh, very much appreciate your time and insights. So uh, have a great week and enjoy that warmer weather I guess you have. (laughs) It's only a mere 72 degrees here today. Oh, okay. Again, our deepest thanks to Mark for sharing both his experiences and what he has learned helping others make the pivot to an encore career. Just in recap, some of the questions we talked about include his journey in creating a career for the second half of life, examples of people he has worked with, what are the key steps and mistakes he's seen made, and what are the first steps in creating your encore career. Please refer to the resources in the show notes including Mark's website, his book, and his podcast. And if you are considering or starting an Encore career, please take the self-assessment quiz to help you create some quick clarity around your possible choices. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.